Intentional or not, Fear Her gives the impression that it was written with a tight budget in mind. The scope of the story is noticeably smaller than most of the series, the setting being another suburban residential neighbourhood where a frightful young girl is overtaken by a lonely alien presence. However, being set some six years into the future from the transmission date, the neighbourhood, even the television romp and circumstance surrounding the Olympics, fails to demonstrate the emotional fever pitch and patriotism that did actually invade the entirety of the nation during the time. The parts of the episode that did work were the mother and daughter bits, where they tried to fight off the evil spirit of Chloe's abusive dead father. Although it's an effective scene that manages to convey a real sense of fear, it's just unfortunate there were not more moments like this, in all honesty, throughout the episode. On its own, the episode does manage to entertain, but compared to some of the more recent Doctor Who episodes we've seen, Fearhead feels extremely derivative and offers nothing that we haven't seen before in previous episodes. In fact, this episode is extremely similar in style to the earlier Series 2 story, The Idiot's Lantern. Replace the alien that possessed Chloe with a television spirit, the 2012 Olympics with the coronation of Queen Elizabeth, and you have an almost identical plotline. The Idiot's Lantern was far more entertaining, however, due to the presence of the eerie television spirit and the creepy face of people. It's very unoriginal, and as I've put on record before, I don't particularly enjoy The Idiot's Lantern, so the neon copy here doesn't really excite me either. Unfortunately, the majority of the story is filled with cliché scripting and performances. This not only applies to the various th- neighbours, but also the possessed Chloe Webber herself. Child actors are notoriously difficult to predict, even in the best of circumstances, and while the young actress gives a startling, touching and a menacing performance as required, the uninspired lines and raspy voice do a little favours. With her own feelings of loneliness being amplified, she is relegated to spending most of the story sulking by herself. Still, the concept of a child being able to draw a person out of reality's existence and into a sketch is a frightful one, though the fact that the Doctor is himself a victim here means there will be an inevitable return without consequence. And again, its transcendence from script to screen is actually a bit of a shocker. Likewise, the desire for the alien to be loved and to belong is a novel concept, in theory, and in and of itself as well, but the resolution with Rose delivering the pod to a celebratory group comes off a little bit too convenient for me. Truly, the last few minutes of the episode are going to divide viewers into two camps, those who feel the intended pride and emotion, and those who cringe under the weight of the overly sentimental events. The Olympic torch being a figurative, and for the isolated literal beacon of hope, Chloe and her mother staying safe from the animated evil drawing her father by singing the Kookaburra song, and eventually returning the Doctor to pick up the fallen torch, and continue to provide hope and inspiration, are all shots to have their supporters and their detractors as well. In fact, having the Doctor appear at the site of the torchbearer is a bit strange, as everyone who has been taken returns to their loved ones ecstatic, and so his appearance so far away seems written more just for the convenience of the visual and ensuing celebration more than anything. Tennant has been given a rough go in his first series, as the scripts continue to steer him towards a hyperactive mania, as seen with the torch lighting. But fortunately, this is balanced out with a more tempered dialogue, as he comforts Rose and tries to figure out the isolated threat earlier in the episode. There's a lot to love about Tennant's betrayal and his doctor, but the maniac outburst being written into seemingly every script sadly do no justice at all, and that's just what you see here. One thing I do kind of like, however, is when the TARDIS materialises at the beginning of the episode. It's a nice little touch, and actually something a little bit clever involving the TARDIS materialisation, and it makes a bit of a change. Fearhead does, however, feel resolutely drab. A key idea of the story is that it is taking place on a typical boring council estate, the crushing normality of the setting theoretically adding to the horror of the children's disappearances. In practice, director Eurus Lynn can't find a way to play against the dullness of the visuals. His heavy use of Dutch angles in the Idiot's Landon verged on ridiculous. But that camera work lent that story into a certain energy that is much missed here. The episode's then near future, now past setting of 2012 London Olympics, makes the story a companion piece of sorts with the Idiot's Lantern. But while the earlier story derived at least some power from its coronation-era setting, Fearhead is then able to do much for 2012. The story is really just set in 2006, except the Olympics are going on, and it's supposed to be 2012. It would be silly to criticise Matthew Grimm for, say, not foreseeing how much social media would come to dominate our corruption events at the Olympics, but even an incorrect prediction of how the world could change in six years between the episode's broadcast and its fictional setting would add some much-needed colour to the story. The Olympics themselves could be of some interest, but the games are never satisfyingly linked to the main story. Yes, the disappearance of the people in the stadium is a big moment in the story, but that could theoretically have happened to any large gathering of people. Fearhead gets closer with its use of the Olympic torch as the engine of the isolated spaceship's rebirth. 
but the discussion of the torture status as a beacon of hope represents Doctor Who's dialogue at its absolute corniest. Hugh Edwards, who went on to announce the actual London Olympics, does his best with the voiceover here, treating the unexpected disappearance of the stadium's worth of people with the measured concern of a true professional. Even so, it's hard to imagine how such a massive disappearance could unfold in front of the entire world without sparking mass pandemonium. It feels deeply implausible that the carrier of the torch would keep on running towards an empty stadium, or the people would throng to the streets to watch him, irrespective of the power of the Olympic spirit, but that's what the story demands, however. There's no bigger victim of the story's illogicality than Chloe's mother Trish. For the plot to work, Trish is required to wander away from her daughter on multiple occasions, and fear her never adequately explains why she repeatedly ignores the Doctor and Rose's explicit instructions. This is the basic problem of making a child, or more specifically, a human child possessed by an alien child, the antagonist. For the threat of Chloe Webber to be all credible, the adults sometimes need to act like complete idiots. That aside, the Isle of Solis actually isn't a bad idea for an adversary, and David Tennant does some nice work when he discusses how fear and loneliness can motivate terrible acts, just as readily as evil ambition can. As Rose points out, the Isle of Solis is throwing a temper tantrum on a planetary scale, and one of the story's more int intriguing elements is the sympathy that the alien's plight provokes in the Doctor. The fact that the Doctor never punishes the Isle of Solis for its misdeeds might have been worth exploring in more detail, but fear her pushes some questions to the background in favour of letting the Doctor light the Olympic flame. Again, the story is by design told by the perspective of the children, not the parents, so the choice makes sense in light of the stated intention. That doesn't make the story's superficiality any less frustrating, though. The one strength of fear, however, is the use of Rose Tyler. Once more, the story recalls the idiot's lantern as the Doctor and Rose split up to pursue their own investigations until one of them is taken by the monster. This time around, it's Rose who is left behind to save the day, and she makes the most of this opportunity to play the hero, no, to play the Doctor, more like. Rose has always been capable of taking alien threats, but she is used to doing so by leaning on her humanity. Way back in Rose, for example, she relied on her childhood gymnastics training to save the Doctor from the nesting consciousness. In Fear Her, Rose effectively steps into the Doctor's shoes, with her one line of the Council spaceship feeling particularly reminiscent of what the Doctor would say. She lacks the time or centuries of experience, and she still needs to track Doctor to drop a vital clue about to re how to recharge the Osiris ship, but the intellect and courage displayed here is entirely her own. The final 15 minutes of the episode reveal that Rose no longer needs the Doctor to defend the Earth. The Doctor's dynamic with Rose hasn't been about teaching her in the same way as previous relationships with classic series companions like Lily or Ace, but still, Fearhead feels like Rose's graduation. Indeed, if this were classic Doctor Who, Fearhead would likely have been Rose's departure episode. She has demonstrated that she could learn all she can from the Doctor, and it's so it's time for her to move on with her life. But the big innovation of the new series has always been its emphasis on emotion, and Rose still needs the Doctor emotionally. Indeed, for all the strength he shows in taking on this Osolus, after the Doctor disappears, Rose seems not just a flyby, on the verge of a breakdown when she realises the Doctor may not be coming back. In its own way, Fear Her represents the natural end point for the Doctor and Rose's time together, but Rose can't see it, going so far, far back to that attempt by claiming that she would never see the two separated. Rose does not learn what Sarah Jane realised back in school reunion, everything must come to an end, and, as the Doctor observes, a storm is approaching. Overall, lacking any originality and exhibiting a serious deficiency of humour or any real memorable moments, it's hard to recommend this episode to anyone, and it's truly one of the worst episodes to ever grace the new series. It is extremely mediocre at best, and that's why I give this episode a 3 out of 10.